Dungeons and Dragons 5e has a tank problem. Specifically, many of the classes that you would generally think of as tank classes lack a good taunt. Let me explain. The tank role is conceptually the member of the party who is meant to attract attacks from enemies and hopefully be able to stand up to quite a few of those attacks. There are definitely certain classes which are good at half of the tank role, which is taking a lot of hits or a lot of damage. The Barbarian's Rage reduces half of incoming bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage. The Path of the Bear Totem gets half of all incoming damage except Psychic. That is certainly very helpful when taking a lot of damage, especially when combined with the tendency for Barbarians to have a high constitution and their massive d12 hit die means they can take a licking and keep on ticking. Barbarians even get a weak taunt in Reckless Attack, which gives the Barbarian advantage on attack, but also gives enemies advantage on attacks against the Barbarian, which should at least somewhat entice your DM to attack you. However, as far as I know, that's the extent of taunts in the base Barbarian class, and I really wish there was a better one. The fighter class, you can have a high AC, you can have heavy armor proficiency, shield proficiency, high proficiency score, plenty of ability score increases if you want to pick up the tough feet or something like that, which means fighters can take a lot of damage. So that's part of being a tank. Plus, fighters can take the interception class feature, which lets you step in to reduce damage that someone else takes, and the battlemaster subclass even has a maneuver which is the second best taunt in the game, the goading attack, which allows you, when you hit, to add a bit of extra damage with your superiority die and force the enemy to make a wisdom saving throw. If they fail, they have disadvantage on attacking anyone who is not you. This can be combined with things like bait and switch which help you benefit your own AC or one of your allies' ACs to make it harder to hit them. To be clear, can't be combined on the same attack can be combined in like a series of attacks, and you get a lot of attacks as a fighter. However, both of those are burning your superiority die, and you only have four of those to start with. Eventually, you get up to six, but that's still not a ton. You get them back on a short rest, so you can be somewhat aggressive in burning them, but it's not ideal. Rune Knights, another fighter subclass, can use their cloud rune to redirect attacks, which helps with the making enemy attacks ineffective part of being a tank, but it's so much worse than the alternative. Last class I kind of want to talk about here, Paladins. You have a high AC, you have a D10 hit die, both of which help you take a lot of attacks. They also get access to the Compelled Duel spell, which takes a bonus action in a first level smite slot, forces another creature to make a wisdom saving throw. If they fail, then it has disadvantage on attacks against people who are not you, and if it tries to move more than 30 feet away from you, it needs to make a wisdom saver, it will not be able to do it. However, this spell is not great. If one of your allies casts anything at it or attacks it, the spell ends. So only you can be attacking this enemy, it takes your concentration, and no one can even help you by debuffing. Plus, it's a wisdom saving throw, so unless you have a really high charisma, that's going to be hard for you as a paladin. This makes this spell pretty frustrating in play, unless you're using it for some narrative reason where you shout out to your party, this is the prince who killed my brother. He is for me and me alone to kill. The rest of you deal with the guard as you send them away and cast compelled duel on this prince you've been obsessed with for the rest of the campaign. Generally, a kind of situational spell and not a super great tank taunt. I should mention the Oath of Conquest has a feature where they can frighten people and then use their Aura of Conquest to stop them from moving, which means you can potentially stop people from moving to attack your party members, but again it's a saving throw they get to repeat at the end of every turn. Oath of Redemption gets Aura the Guardian, which lets you take damage instead of other people in your party, but you're still taking the damage, you know? So now that I've talked about all these problems with the other tank classes, what am I going to recommend? The best tank subclass in Dungeons & Dragons is the Armorer Artificer subclass. First introduced in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, the Artificer subclass is a half-caster, though with a slightly different rounding rule than other half-casters, plus they get cantrips. 
They're often inventors, tinkerers, alchemists, or artisans channeling their magic through their creation. They only have a D8 hit die, which hurts when you're building a tank, but this will be counterbalanced by other features we discuss. The armorer subclass in specific focuses on magically enhanced armor. We will discuss how this class plays and the features that really come through when you build it, but for now we are primarily interested in one class feature. Armor model, specifically the guardian form of the armor. The guardian armor has two specific sub-features that we depend on. The thunder gauntlets. This feature is the best tank taunt in the game. Your gauntlets count as a simple melee weapon as long as you are not holding anything and you have no reason to be holding anything because you can use your armor as your arcane focus. Throw a shield in your other hand, and you can both cast and do melee attacks without paying the warcaster tax. You can also use your intelligence modifier for this, same as our spell casting, which means we do not need a high strength, especially since one of our features is that we bypass strength requirements for armor. When we hit, it does 1d8 thunder damage, plus our intelligence or strength modifier, depending on whatever we're using to hit. And the great thing about thunder damage is it's less commonly resisted than bludgeoning damage. Then we get to the really powerful part of this feature, and I'm going to read directly from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything for this. A creature hit by the gauntlets has disadvantage on attack rolls against targets other than you until the start of your next turn as the armor magically emits a distracting pulse when the creature attacks someone else. This means every single time we attack someone, we do an excellent job of convincing them to attack us instead of someone else. Unlike the Battlemaster's goading attack, there is no saving throw. There is also no resource burn. This applies every single time we hit with our thunder gauntlets. No saving throw, no resource burn, and armor artificers still get extra attack at level 5 like other half-caster marshals, even though our spell slots and cantrips are better than other half-casters. Plus, between heavy armor, a shield, and infusions that can boost our defense even higher, many of the, the attacks we are baiting won't even hit us. The second feature the Guardian Armor gets at level 3 that helps this character remain an effective tank is the Defensive Field feature. Reading directly from the book again, as a bonus action, you can gain temporary hit points equal to your level in this class, replacing any temporary hit points you already have. You lose these temporary hit points if you doff the armor. You can use this bonus action a number of times equal to your proficiency bonus, and you regain all expended uses when you finish a long rest. This means that we have access to a significant pool of extra hit points that we can use a really nice boost to our survivability. I recently played from level 15 to level 20, an armor artificer multi-class, and it was so much fun to make my DM just come at me over and over, leaving the more effective people to remain effective. Before we get into a build that uses this taunt effectively, I first want to talk about some of the reasons I think there are not better tank taunts, and some of the things you should consider as a player before taking on this role. Before we get into the build, I want to talk a little bit about the problems with playing a tank. The first is that party roles, in the very gamer sense I have been talking about them, have fallen out of favor at many tables, I think. Blame it on Critical Role or Dimension 20 if you want. Two shows I love and that have massively influenced my DM and playstyle but I think many D&D tables nowadays emphasize roleplay and big cinematic set-piece combat sessions, and many of the newer expansion books for 5e have emphasized versatile subclasses and backgrounds. Think about the party Rogue Role that emphasizes sneaking, lockpicking, and disabling traps. This class is still really good at filling this role, but if you're in a campaign that doesn't have a rogue, you can generally get by. Have an artificer in your party. They get proficiency in thieves tools at level 1, expertise in tools at level 6, and will be great at picking locks if you give them a little bit of dexterity. And there's a subclass, the armorer, with the infiltrator armor instead of the guardian armor we're focusing on today that gives you advantage on stealth. Don't want to play a rogue or an artificer? 
Well, if you play any other class but take the criminal or spy background, then you will also get proficiency in thieves tools. Add someone with pass without a trace to the party, and you all will still be quite sneaky. Have a different background idea in mind? Well, consider the investigator background, one of the house agent backgrounds, the myriad operative background, or one of several others that give you thieves tools proficiency. Want a completely different background? As long as you're playing a half-elf, half-orc, or human, you can take the prodigy feat and gain proficiency in thieves tools, and if you built your character cleverly, you can probably also pick up expertise in stealth. If your DM allows it, you could even play an autonome. They get proficiency in any two tools. Warforge get a tool proficiency as well. My point is not that this is a bad thing, but just part of the 5e design philosophy seems to be enabling many paths to a functional party. There's another dynamic that makes tanks somewhat less effective in 5e. Combat often does not seem to last very long. As Colby over at D4 will tell you, burst damage is the king, queen, and the gods above in 5e. Being able to do a ton of damage early in the combat is the biggest and most helpful thing you can do. Shifting the action economy even slightly fundamentally changes battles. There's ways around this your DM might rely on for making sure the action economy is steeply against you at the beginning, running more enemies with legendary actions and a lot of hit points, or running lots of like high hit point mobs or swarms. But fundamentally in 5e, action economy is king and burst damage has the biggest effect on combat. And most combats do not last very long, at least not to reach a point where you can tell who is likely to win without new enemies hitting the field. The longest combats in my recent campaign where I was a player that went up to level 20, the longest combats we had ran like 10 rounds at most, and that was often split over like a couple of phases with the boss transforming or moving or us being teleported as part of the battle to some other plane or field or something. And I think most combats generally run shorter than that, especially at my tables when I'm DMing. This fact makes a character who is intended to absorb hits for many rounds somewhat less valuable in the overall design. It's not that they cannot have value, but it seems to me to be a somewhat less valuable role than, say, control or someone with great weapon master or sharpshooter. Talk to your DM, think about your table, but at my table, I did have a ton of fun playing a tank build that was reminiscent of what I'm about to show you. With that out of the way, and without further ado, we're going to start with the bugbear race because it is incredibly powerful. It is so powerful that you should absolutely discuss with your DM about whether or not it will fit with the setting and the style of play at the table. This is always good advice, but especially if you're doing anything resembling power gaming, min-maxing, or game-breaking. A good DM will work with you as you work with them to make sure you feel satisfied in play, and so does everyone else at the table. Recently, I've been talking with my DM for the campaign where I'm a player about how to appropriately nerf the College of Eloquence class to make it appropriate. It's just part of the process at a good table. However, if your DM allows you to play a bugbear, let's talk about its features from least to most important. You're a humanoid, which counts as a goblinoid. You're a medium creature, walking speed of 30 feet, dark vision, fey ancestry, so advantage on saving throws to avoid being charmed. You count as one size larger when determining how much you can carry or move. You are proficient in stealth. You can easily move through spaces intended for small creatures. All good stuff, but the important two are long-limbed. Reading from the book again, when you make a melee attack on your turn, your reach for it is five feet greater than normal. And then surprise attack. Reading from the book, if you hit a creature with an attack roll, the creature takes an extra 2d6 damage if it hasn't taken a turn yet in the current combat. Let's start with long-limbed. Rules as written, it says that your thunder gauntlets are going to work from 10 feet away instead of 5 feet, which will be useful for avoiding some opportunity attack, especially early on in this build. can also force enemies to move to get you, which will be useful if you have someone casting something that hurts the enemy, like a spike growth. Now again, your DM might say, you can't punch someone from 10 feet away. That's ridiculous. And if your DM says this, I think they're being eminently reasonable. But rules are rules for this hypothetical build here. The second really useful feature lets us increase our damage on every single individual we can attack before they have had a turn. 
they take 2d6 extra damage, which is wonderful. Now again, talk to your DM, but despite the word surprise being in the feature name, it does not require your enemy to be surprised, just for you to be going before them in the first round of combat. Ability scores we're going to go with point by, 13 in strength, 9 in dexterity, 14 in con, and we're going to give that our plus 2 for a total of 16, 15 in intelligence, and we're going to give that our plus 1 for a total of 16, 8 in wisdom, and 13 in charisma. We're a bit multi-ability score dependent on this build because of eventual multi-classes that I want to take, so I don't love all those odd numbers, and I especially don't love how easy it will be for us to fail wisdom saving throws, but it is what it is. For background, choose whatever you like. It does not particularly matter. I took Sailor. With that established, let's get into the build. Level 1, we're starting Fighter. This is not necessary, and if you want to start Artificer because it fits your build or your backstory better, then go for it. I want Constitution saving through proficiency, and will eventually be taking Fighter levels, so figured we might as well get into it. At level 1 as a Fighter, you get proficiency in all armors and shields, simple and martial weapons, and two skills from a pretty good list. Pick whatever you like for those proficiencies. I went with acrobatics and insight. You get a fighting style, and I would take defense, which gives you a plus one to AC when you're wearing armor. You also gain the second wind feature, which lets you use a bonus action once per short rest to regain 1d10 plus your fighter level hit points which helps your survivability a little more. At level 1, I have 13 hit points and an AC of 19 with chainmail and a shield. Right now, you will play like a somewhat ineffective sword and board fighter, running up and slashing at the enemies. Level 2, we're taking our first artificer level. We gain proficiency in thieves tools and tinkerers tools, which is nice to have. We gain the magical tinkering feature, which lets us create some fun little effects. Mostly useful out of combat, and we start gaining our spells. For cantrips, I will take booming blade, which lets us add some damage to our attack if the enemy is foolish enough to move, and as we discussed, our extra reach will help motivate them to move. I would also take Shocking Grasp, because I want to be able to use my Intelligence modifier to attack already, and this takes away enemies' opportunity attacks as well. For spells, I would take Absorb Elements. It lets you get, with a reaction, on-demand resistance to an elemental damage, and then add that back on your next attack. Long Strider will be useful to increase our movement speed when we need it, especially if we know combat is coming and we can get it off without using one of our combat rounds. Expeditious Retreat lets us dash as a bonus action, which again helps us get to where the baddies are. In combat, you try to run up and use your Shocking Grasp or Booming Blade to do some damage, ideally from 10 feet away, hopefully avoiding opportunity attacks. We use our spell slots for Absorb Elements or Expeditious Retreat if we need it. Level 3, we take another Artificer level. We gain a Core Artificer feature, which lets us infuse items with a bit of magic. At this level, for known infusions, I would take Enhanced Defense, which will give us a plus 1 to our AC, Enhanced Arcane Focus, which would give us a plus 1 bonus to spell attack rolls, Enhanced Weapon, which would make our weapon magical and give it a plus 1, and Mind Sharpener which lets us use four charges in reaction to maintain concentration. The two I have active for now are Enhanced Defense and Enhanced Arcane Focus. We now have a 20 AC, and mostly in combat we run up and use Shocking Grasp to do damage. In terms of spells, I would add Fairy Fire. If we have a setup round, it can be really useful to have it for giving other people and yourself advantage on attack. We mostly use our spell slots for Absorb Elements and Expeditious Retreat when they're needed. Level 4, we take another Artificer level. We gain the right tool for the job feature, which lets us make any artisan tools we need, and we finally get our subclass and we are taking Armorer. We gain proficiency in Smith's tools, letting us work on our armor, and we get the Arcane Armor feature, which is important for us. You spend an hour with any armor, and we get to make it special and give it the following properties. Strength requirements for armor no longer apply to us, so we are switching to plate armor, which makes our AC 22. We can use our armor as our spellcasting focus. Our armor cannot be removed against our will and covers your entire body and can serve as a prosthesis. You can take the armor on or off with an action. We can also finally pick our armor type and change it with an hour of time. The Infiltrator form gives you advantage on stealth checks, a good ranged attack option, and a little more movement speed. But what we care about is the Guardian form. 
This gives us those delicious thunder gauntlets and that wonderful defensive field. We also gain the magic missile and thunder wave spells thanks to this subclass. At this point, I would trade out Shocking Grasp for Guidance, because Guidance is incredible, and we now have a way to attack with our intelligence using our Thunder Gauntlets. In combat, we now run up, hit them with the Thunder Gauntlets, either from 10 feet away if you want to avoid opportunity attacks, or from 5 feet away if you want to add Booming Blade damage, and then we use our spell slots for Absorb Elements and Expeditious Retreat when they're needed. Level 5, we take another Artificer level. We gain our first ability score, increase our feet, and we are taking the mobile feet. The mobile feet increases our movement speed by 10 feet, plus if we take the dash action on our turn, which includes Long Strider, we bypass difficult terrain, and most importantly, it says that when we make a melee attack against a creature, whether we miss or hit, we do not provoke opportunity attacks from that creature. This will let us run in, punch, and retreat, forcing them to move. Now in combat, you want to be running up, using Booming Blade in your Thunder Gauntlets, and running away. They will take the extra Booming Blade damage on a hit, and if they want to hit you back, we'll need to move, taking the rest of the Booming Blade damage. Plus, remember, on the first round, if you hit them before their turn, you get to add your 2d6 extra surprise damage. In terms of spells, I would add Sanctuary. It's a bonus action spell that you can cast on yourself, that means that any creature that tries to attack the sanctuary creature first needs to make a wisdom saving throw or direct it at someone else. This means we can potentially hit someone, run away, give them disadvantage on attacking anyone who is not us, and if they do try to attack us, they need to make a wisdom saving throw if they want to first. You can like totally take an enemy out for a round of combat. Level 6, we take another artificer level and we finally get extra attack. We're up to 53 hit points, too, by the way, plus our little stash of four temporary hit points we get from our defensive field. We finally have second level spell slots, and we always have Mirror Image and Shatter prepared. If you decided against taking the mobile feat, you'll probably want to take Kinetic Jaunt, which gives you most of the same features but with having to burn a spell. I want to avoid the resource drain, and so I went with the mobile feat here. I would also consider adding Vortex Warp to your spells for extra mobility on the battlefield. At this point, you should trade out Booming Blade for something else, because we will almost always want to use both of our attacks instead of just one, and so we cannot use Booming Blade as our action anymore. You might want to take Firebolt or Ray of Frost to have a good range option. In combat, you will run up and try to attack someone. If you hit, you will run to someone else and attack them as well. Then you will retreat from both of those people with both of them now having disadvantage if they attack anyone who is not you. Level 7. We are back to fighter levels because, yep, we won Action Surge. Action Surge gives us an entire extra action, letting us potentially attack two other people. This is potentially huge in terms of drawing people to attack you and can help you do other casting or movement things if needed. This is a huge level for making this character feel like a super effective taunt-based tank. Level 8, we take a level in Paladin. Some DMs don't love people multi-classing this many classes, so as always, talk to your DM. We eventually want Divine Smites, so we're going to be taking two levels of Paladin in total. This level does not fundamentally change the character much. It adds Lay on Hands, which is a nice little bit of healing, and it adds Divine Sense, which lets us see if there's any Celestials, Fiends, or Undead around us. We're still doing the exact same thing as the last couple levels. Run up, punch, punch, action surge if we need to, punch, punch, retreat. Level 9. We're taking another level in Paladin, and we get Smites. This lets us burn our spell slots to add extra D8s to our attacks for as long as we have spell slots. We also get another fighting style here. Pick your favorite. I went with Interception, which lets us reduce damage to someone next to us, which, again, makes sense as a tank. In combat, we're still running between as many people as possible to attract attacks, and we get to add some smites onto those to really do some extra damage. Don't forget about your D6s if you're punching people before they take a turn on the first round. For Paladin spells, I would take Bless, and I have a whole video on why you should do that, though mostly use it if you get a setup round. Other than that, take what you want, favoring things that don't require a saving throw. Your charisma's not great. I went with Shield of Faith because we might want to sometimes use 
our bonus action to boost our AC to 24. This is the core of the build, and depending on your specific campaign and how you imagine the character, you can take it in tons of directions. You can take extra artificer levels and get more spell slots and infusion, take more paladin levels eventually getting an oath and auras, or maybe something a little silly. I feel a little silly. Level 10, we're taking a level in wizard. I know, I know, I know. Spell slot progression really helps with the burst damage. I know, I know, I know. And as we already discussed, burst damage is king and queen in 5e, and I know, I know, I know. But adding in a full caster really helps our spell slot progression. If your DM is not cool with this, then don't do it. I'm already three classes deep, and this is the fourth class we're adding to the build. If your DM doesn't want you to add this, stick with Artificer and Paladin, and it's still very satisfying in play. But here on the internet, we can do whatever we want. And we now have 87 hit points, and we now have two third level spell slots. At level one in Wizard, we get Arcane Recovery, which lets us get some spell slots back which is great. We might sometimes want more smite slots. In terms of cantrips, I would add mending, because we arguably should have taken it sooner as an artificer. Makes sense for you to be able to fix things. Mind sliver, because it's a ranged cantrip with a nice little debuff, and then whatever works with your character concept. In terms of spells, I would add shield, because a reaction to add five to our AC is wonderful, because we don't want to get hit. Silvery barbs, if your DM allows it, because this spell is broken as hell. At my table, it requires a second level spell slot. Talk to your DM and see what they say. Other than that, pick your favorites. Our combat still looks the same, but now we have extra spell slots for more smites. Level 11, we are taking another level in Wizard. For Arcane Tradition, we are picking School of Abjuration. This gives us our Arcane Ward, which effectively grants us an additional set of hit points that could hit before our temporary hit points. It has hit points of double our Wizard level and our intelligence modifier, so 7 hit points right now, but does require us to burn an abjuration spell to initially get it up. When we cast abjuration spells, mostly just shield for now, we get to regain hit points equal to twice the level of the spell. This helps make us a little more tank-like, because it hits our arcane ward, it hits our defensive field, and then finally, finally it hits us. We are still mostly running around and punching people. Level 12, another level in wizard. We break the triple digit hit point mark with 101 and we get second level wizard spells. I would make sure to take Misty Step for extra mobility. Other than that, trust your instincts. Level 13, we're taking another level in wizard. And remember, these wizard levels are helping your arcane ward. We have 108 hit points and we also get another ASI, which we're going to use to boost our intelligence. We also have a second fourth level spell slot, which is wonderful for smites. Remember, fourth level is where damage for divine smite caps out. Level 14, we're taking another level in Wizard. We have 115 hit points, we get a 5th level spell slot, which we will mostly use for non-divine smite things, because those cap at level 4. We also finally know 3rd level spells, and there's 2 I really want here. Counter spell, because it's so overpowered as I talk about in this video, and a Shardalon Stride. The billowing flames of a dragon blast from your feet, granting you explosive speed. For the duration, your speed increases by 20 feet, and moving doesn't provoke opportunity attacks. When you move within 5 feet of a creature or an object that isn't being worn or carried, it takes 1d6 fire damage from your trail of heat. A creature or object can take this damage only once during a turn. And when you upcast this, your speed increases by an extra 5 feet per level, and the damage increases by 1d6 per level. What this means is that if we cast a Shardalon Stride, with our 5th level spell slot, it increases our speed to 70 feet per round, and it will do 3d6 damage to everyone we run by. We are still running between enemies, punching as many as possible to draw their attacks towards us, hopefully doing the extra surprise attack damage on the first round, adding extra smite damage whenever we can, and 3d6 damage every time we move past someone. Level 15, we go back to Artificer. We have 123 hit points, our Artificer Defensive Field, and our Abjuration Wizard Arcane Ward to help keep us alive. We get two more infusions to know, and one more to have prepared. For known, I added Spell Refueling Ring and Boots of the Winding Path. We will be switching Enhanced Arcane Focus to instead have Mind Sharpener, because we really want to keep concentration up on a Shardalon Stride. We will also keep Spell Refueling Ring to get another Smite Slot. Level 16, we're taking another level in Artificer. 
We have 131 hit points, our arcane ward, and our defensive field. We get Flash of Genius at this level, which lets us add our intelligence modifier plus four to many d20 rolls, and this includes Counter Spell, which is really powerful. We also get another fifth level spell slot, which lets us cast a Shardalon Stride at that high level twice per long rest now. Level 17, we are taking another level in Artificer, maxing out our intelligence with the ability score increase. We are burning people up with our stride, punching people, action searching when we need to, and dropping an absurd amount of smites into them as we go. Level 18, from here you can really do whatever you want. Two more levels in Paladin would give you an ASI, which might be useful. Three more levels in Wizard would also give you an ASI. Fourth level spells in a better Arcane Ward. More levels in Paladin would give you an Oath and those features, but we never get to Aura, so I don't think it's worth it. Because this is supposed to be an Artificer, I think I'm going to go with an Artificer level here. This gets us a new feature called Armor Modifications, which effectively breaks our armor into more pieces and gives us two more infusions we're allowed to have prepared. We're going to add Enhanced Weapon to our Thunder Gauntlets and Enhanced Arcane Focus to get that extra bonus to our Spell Save DC. We also now have a level 6 spell slot. If we use it for a Shardalon Stride, we now have a movement speed of 75 feet per round and do 4d6 damage to everyone we run by, plus the damage from our Thunder Gauntlets, plus Smites, plus 2d6 if it's the first round of combat and we're hitting them before they've had a turn. Level 19. We don't really need this anymore, but I cannot help myself, so we're taking another level in Wizard. Let's us send our ward towards one of our friends to help protect them, so that's cool, and it makes our ward better, of course. We're running around, lighting everyone on fire, slamming them with smites, and making them attack us instead of our friends. Level 20, we're going to cap it off with one more level in Wizard to get 4th level spells. We have 161 hit points, a great arcane ward, and the Artificer's defensive field, helping us stand up to a lot of combat. For fourth level spells, I would recommend Fire Shield because it hurts people who do eventually hit you, Polymorph because it's such a useful multi-purpose spell, and Banishment because it's an abjuration spell that sends enemies packing. We also now have a level seven spell slot. If we use it for a Shardalon Stride, we now have a movement speed of 80 feet per round and do 5d6 damage to everyone we run by. We are running around. Everyone is on fire. They are being smite. They can't attack anyone. We might still be using Sanctuary, so they also can't really attack us. And we are just controlling, tanking, taunting, and pulling everything in towards us, letting everyone else in our party, damage dealers, controllers, debuffers, healers, be effective and not have to deal with these enemies really biting through them. And that's really it. I think this taunt is by far the best tank taunt. And building it this way has made it a potent burst damage dealer as well. Like I mentioned before, there's other ways to do this. You could replace the wizard levels with sorcerer, bard. You could skip the fighter levels if you don't want the extra burst. If you don't need truly maxed out damage, you can keep progressing artificer. Mostly my point is I am glad that 5e has at least one tank taunt, which works. If you want to take a more detailed look at this build, then check out the description. I have a bunch of links to this build at different levels on D&D Beyond so you can see what it looks like and even use it for your sessions if you want. Let me know in the comments what you think and how you think tanks work in 5e.